Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse, and I have invited Ray Pete, Ph.D., who has a background in biology from the University of Oregon, who specializes in physiology. He's also taught at the University of Oregon, Urbana College, Montana State University, the National College of Naturopathic Medicine, and in Mexico as well. He's written many, many papers on physiological chemistry and physics. His key idea is that energy and structure are interdependent at every level. He is known for his views on progesterone, on balancing the female hormones, on understanding them. And he's written a lot about radiation and growth, on cholesterol, on natural estrogens, and about pregnenolone and memory. He's written hundreds and hundreds of articles, and he has some very, very helpful and very robust views on human health, including some that will defy some of the beliefs you may have about fish oils and saturated fats and understanding natural and bioidentical hormones. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Ray Pete to It's Rainmaking Time. Good afternoon. Hi. Thank you so much for being here. You've been one of the big proponents, it seems early on, of natural progesterone. And I wondered if you could speak about it and your findings early on about natural progesterone. Yeah, in 1968, I decided to go back to graduate school in biology. I had been working in linguistics and other areas, and I decided that to, to understand anything, it would help to understand how the brain works, but then I found that the brain researchers were just as dogmatic as the people in in linguistics, and I found the least dogmatic area in biology was uh, reproductive physiology and aging research because there were so few people getting big money to do it, so they were relatively free. And my thesis advisor, Arnold Soderwall had studied the effects of vitamin E on reproductive aging, and I was uh, going to specialize on how the oxidative process changes during aging and whether that affects reproductive efficiency and so on that decreases with aging. And it turned out that it was looking as if estrogen increased with aging, while progesterone decreased just about the time infertility sets in. And that was contrary to all of the textbooks, but being an actual scientist, as Soderwall said, if if it's repeatable, go ahead and do it. And in any of the other areas of biology, like in nerve biology, if I would observe something that seemed to violate the textbook, description of what a cell is, professor would just pretend he hadn't seen it because uh, they were getting their funding to develop a certain line of thinking. But since there was so little money put into reproduction and aging, actual science was allowed to go ahead. And other people working in the same lab eventually did the same kind of tests and found that in various situations, the tissues of of other animals actually increased their estrogen content with aging. But since progesterone is decreasing, progesterone happens to be what inhibits the formation of estrogen inside cells all through the body. And if you don't have very much progesterone, the estrogen goes on being synthesized, but it can't escape from the cell into the bloodstream where it could be excreted from the body. So while the body is actually loading up inside the cells with estrogen, when there's a progesterone deficiency, the blood shows a very low level of estrogen because it can't leave the cell. It needs uh, things such as progesterone to uh, loosen it from the binding proteins called receptors in the cells. So seeing that the um, estrogen excess causes a wasting of oxygen in the tissues that basically suffocates 
the embryo that's trying to implant and grow, so it prevents pregnancy. And that explains how the birth control pill works. It creates an excess of estrogen in the tissues, suffocating the uh, fertilized egg and uh, preventing its implantation and growth. And when you look at stress, malnutrition and various stressors that decrease your thyroid and progesterone production uh, have that same effect as aging or taking an estrogen supplement. It leads to the progressive increase of estrogen inside cells along with all of the associated things caused by high estrogen. And that creates effectively an oxygen deficiency, which leads to progressive loss of all of the differentiated functions. I imagine that during the time at which you were talking about this and writing about it, that when Dr. John Lee came around, that you got a lot of confirmation. Yeah, I used to give talks to medical groups. There were organizations of uh, orthomolecular doctors all up and down the West Coast. And I think it was the second time that I talked to his group in, I think it was the San Francisco area, I noticed one of the doctors actually seemed to wake up and pay attention, and that was John Lee. The others just couldn't hear anything that said estrogen wasn't the female hormone that decreases at at menopause. He got heavily attacked when he came out with what you were proposing and what you saw as an observation with that kind of discovery, and I think he kind of front-runned it in the public domain even though you were out there for years talking about it. Oddly enough, we lost him at a very young age. My question to you is, the orthomolecular focus, the anti-aging focus, the optimization focus now, like the Life Extension Foundation, which tests for a lot of different things. I'm a member of their organization, and I like it that you can order your own blood tests and that you can be more in charge of your health. But DHEA has been around forever. It's in our bodies. And a lot of women are supplementing with progesterone now and also adding a little bit of DHEA. And even though DHEA can convert to testosterone and to estrogen, on low levels, women are using it. What do you think about it? In, I think it was a 1971 article I wrote, I mentioned DHEA as being one of the basic protective hormones like progesterone. Progesterone happens to um, be the main thing that protects against the um, conversion of DHEA into estrogen. Testosterone is really just as much a, a female hormone as a male hormone. Estrogen is somewhat more a male hormone. It's what is responsible for differentiating the male brain so if I had to call it a gender hormone, I would say it's probably more a male hormone. How interesting. I don't think most of us would associate it with that. That's very interesting. Progesterone is the real feminizing hormone. It protects against excess of anything, including excess estrogen, excess testosterone, or cortisone, or aldosterone, all of the major types of steroid hormone uh, are either uh, progesterone makes up for deficiency of any of those, but it also protects against a toxic excess of any of them. So if someone's taking a low level of DHEA and progesterone, it's kind of a nice combination? Uh, yeah, as long as you're watching your general diet and uh, thyroid function, it's possible to override the protective effect of progesterone if you eat a lot of unsaturated fat and not enough protein and calcium, for example. And unsaturated fat for the public would mean what? Corn oil, soy oil, canola. How about grapeseed oil? Yeah, yeah. Everything that's liquid has a lot of polyunsaturated fat. Olive oil, which will harden at refrigerator temperatures, still has about 10% of the polyunsaturated fats. I don't think a person should eat more than maybe an average of a teaspoonful or two of olive oil per day. Butter and coconut oil are really the